Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to True Crime Cases. I'm your host, Lainey. If you've been immersed in the true crime world for some time, you're likely aware of the unfortunate reality that perpetrators of violent crime disproportionately target specific groups in our society. Women, people of color, members of the LGBTQ community, drug users, and sex workers often find themselves facing violence at alarmingly higher rates than the general population. Tragically, the more these factors apply to an individual, the greater their vulnerability becomes to the darkest elements of society. This vulnerability stems from a multitude of reasons. First and foremost, it's fueled by the despicable opinions some individuals hold. From as early as school age, bigotry breeds violence. Those deemed different are often seen as weaker targets, subjected to bullying, and in the most horrifying cases, even worse. Furthermore, societal biases play a significant role in exacerbating this issue. Deep-rooted prejudices impact not only how crimes are committed, but also how they're handled by law enforcement. Shockingly, statistics reveal a stark contrast in the treatment of marginalized communities. For instance, while Black Americans make up only 13% of the U.S. population, they represent a staggering 37% of the prison population. Moreover, they are disproportionately targeted for arrest, with white offenders often receiving preferential treatment. This disparity extends to other marginalized groups as well. Sex workers and drug users, marginalized by society and the law, frequently find themselves discounted or dismissed when reporting crimes against them. Their voices are often silenced and their plight is ignored. In today's episode, we delve into a chilling series of crimes that tragically epitomize these injustices. The victims and the lone survivor all fell within these at-risk categories. They were predominantly women, predominantly sex workers, many grappling with substance abuse issues, and most were people of color. In this episode, we unravel the harrowing tale of the 2018 spree and serial killings that terrorized the streets of Laredo, Texas. A special acknowledgement is owed to journalist Skip Hollinsworth of Texas Monthly and a personal hero, whose meticulous coverage of these events provided invaluable insights for our research. Okay, on to the show. Laredo, Texas, situated along the banks of the Rio Grande, straddles the U.S.-Mexican border with its twin city, Nuevo Laredo, just across the river. This unique location makes it a significant hub for customs and border protection operations, with two border patrol stations and two border crossing stations. Despite its proximity to the border, Laredo was long considered one of the safest cities in Texas, especially when contrasted with the perceived cartel-controlled Nuevo Laredo. Murders within Laredo remained relatively low, rarely exceeding a dozen per year throughout the 2010s. Remarkably, sex work in Laredo often unfolded openly along San Bernardo Avenue, the city's main thoroughfare. The sex workers, many of whom were locals, were familiar faces to residents. They formed a tight-knit community, often supporting each other professionally and personally, sharing meals, motel rooms, and clothing. This candid depiction serves as a stark reminder that these women were not just workers in the world's oldest profession, but individuals with lives, friendships, and struggles like anyone else. Among these women was Melissa Ramirez, a bright and compassionate soul who, despite facing her battles, remained fiercely devoted to her family. From a young age, Melissa's warmth and generosity shone through, but her life took a tragic turn when she became a victim of sexual assault in high school. Struggling to cope, Melissa turned to drugs, eventually leading her into the dangerous world of sex work to support her addiction. Despite her hardships, Melissa's family cherished her, especially her mother, Christina, who lovingly called her Mi Niña Hermosa, 
or my beautiful girl. Melissa, in turn, adored her children and strived to provide them with a happy and stable home life. However, on September 2, 2018, tragedy struck. Desperate for money and drugs, Melissa left her mother's home in Rio Bravo to work along San Bernardo Avenue, not knowing it would be her last journey. Out of money and out of drugs, Melissa walked out of her mother's house in Rio Bravo and caught a bus to downtown Laredo. She was heading to San Bernardo Avenue to work, and her family knew that meant she would most likely be gone for a few days. They weren't expecting police to arrive at their door the next afternoon with devastating news. Around noon on September 3rd, a rancher called 911 to report that he had found the body of a young woman face down at the side of a dirt road 24 miles away from Laredo. She was holding a bag of candy, M&Ms, and she had been shot four times at point-blank range with a 40 caliber pistol. Three shots to the head and one to the wrist. The rancher was surprised to see a patrol car appear shortly after the call because law enforcement was usually stationed far away. The rancher attempted to flag it down and was perplexed when the car turned around and drove away. There was no way the officer driving could have missed the body lying in the road. When the officers who had been sent out finally arrived at the crime scene, they were just as confused as the rancher at this behavior and noted the strange activity. The scene was documented and the body was transported to the morgue. It was there that she was identified as 29-year-old Melissa Ramirez, a match made by fingerprints that had been taken due to a prostitution charge 10 years earlier. Two Texas Rangers and two detectives were dispatched to Melissa's home, and there they informed a grief-stricken Christina Benavides that her beautiful girl was dead. She was shakily able to give some details she remembered about one of Melissa's clients, an older man in a black truck, but not much more. Once the officers left her home, she fled to the home of a neighbor, inconsolable. She wept that she could not afford a funeral and that she did not know what to tell her grandchildren about their mother. Later, Christina remembered a haunting detail that had seemed inconsequential. She claimed that only weeks before her death, Melissa had told her mother, They're going to kill me, Mom, and mimed a gun being pressed against her head. Christina had no idea who they were or why Melissa said such a thing, and sadly, she would never find out. The investigation into Melissa's murder got off to a slow start. They knew that she had worked San Bernardo Avenue and spoke to other sex workers who frequented the area. Many of them were friends with Melissa and were heartbroken to hear that she had been murdered, but none of them had seen her on September 2nd, and none of them knew any clients that had been causing her trouble. Neither had Priscilla Villarreal, a citizen journalist who spent most of her nights in Laredo chasing down crimes to livestream to her Facebook followers. She said that Melissa had been a lovely girl and couldn't imagine anyone wanting to hurt her. Officers looked into contacts on Melissa's phone and contacted several clients that way. They could rule out all of them individually, including the man in the black truck that Christina had remembered. They all had concrete alibis and couldn't help them further with the investigation. The unknown police car that had avoided the scene was another lead that went nowhere. The investigators could identify the driver through cameras installed around where Melissa was found. The U.S. Border Patrol placed these cameras to monitor potential drug mules or undocumented immigrants making their way across the border. A license plate check confirmed the officer's identity, but he was quickly ruled out as a suspect. He had been in the area to look at a property. He avoided the crime scene because his young daughter was in the car with him, and he didn't want to traumatize her by attending the incident. The amount of surveillance Border Patrol had on the area made them a valuable asset during the investigation. Run out of the South Texas Border Intelligence Center, it touched base with every law enforcement agency in the area. They tasked Intelligence Supervisor Juan David Ortiz with assisting with the investigation, and his team ran the license plates. Unfortunately, their efforts were not enough to stop the killer in their tracks. Melissa's friends were terrified. They knew that she had been taken from San Bernardo, 
and that continuing to work there put them at risk. But they also could not afford to stop working. One of these friends was 42-year-old Claudine Luetta, who had lived in the area her entire life. According to her sister Angie, both of them had a difficult childhood, and some unknown but awful event had happened when she was five years old that changed her irreparably. She had gone to high school in San Bernardo, and although she managed to get a position as a clerk in the district attorney's office after graduation, an addiction to heroin soon led her to working on that same road. Her addiction and sex work led to CPS taking away her five children, but as they were placed with Claudine's sister and their aunt, she was still able to keep contact with them. She tried rehab time and time again, desperate to get clean for the sake of her kids, but nothing ever seemed to stick. Despite everything that had happened to her, Claudine was a loving, caring woman who was kind to everyone who knew her. As she was older than the majority of sex workers in the area, she took on an almost motherly role with them. She wanted to make sure everyone was looked after, maybe hoping that they could succeed in leaving this life as she had often longed to. When Claudine heard about what happened to Melissa, the first thing she did was visit her eldest child seeking comfort. She told her daughter, who was by this time a college student, that she wanted to get clean and leave sex work for good. Claudine was scared, and she confided in her daughter that she believed she knew who had killed Melissa. Investigators soon learned that Claudine Luera was someone to look out for, someone who had such a wide network of friends and acquaintances and was so familiar with the area that she had to know something. They called the intelligence center on September 13th, advising them to try and get in touch with Claudine on their behalf. But it was already too late. Her heroin addiction had driven her back to San Bernardo Avenue, and the next day, she was dead. Claudine's death was not as quick or as clean as Melissa's. She was shot in the head at close range, same as Melissa, but she survived the assault for several hours. It seems her killer assumed her dead, and when he left the scene of her attack, she was able to crawl out of the area of long grass where she was concealed, to the side of the road where she could be seen. She was less than two miles from where Melissa had been killed. When a big rig driver found her and called 911, she was still breathing. Claudine died in the afternoon of September 14th, and had been clinging on to life for five hours before she passed away. It was speculated by those who knew Claudine and what kind of person she was that she had confronted Melissa's killer, something that was later confirmed by the killer himself. She had willingly entered the truck belonging to the man she believed to have murdered her friend and accused him of being Melissa's client on the night she was murdered. For this incredible act of courage, Claudine had her life taken from her. To avoid causing panic, police attempted to keep the likely connection between the two murders quiet. However, it didn't take long for the public and the media to realize there was a serial killer at large in Laredo, targeting sex workers and dumping their bodies on rural roads outside of the city. This method of disposal, out in the open rather than somewhere concealed, was cause for concern in and of itself, as it indicated the killer wanted his victims to be found. He wanted people to fear him. Priscilla Villarreal, the citizen journalist I mentioned earlier, definitely feared him. More than anything, though, she feared for the safety of the women working on San Bernardo. Villarreal started to frequent the area more frequently, looking out for the sex workers and urging them to stay home until it was more safe. But it wasn't that easy. This was their livelihood and the sex workers simply could not afford to wait in safety until the killer was caught. So Villarreal instead focused on making sure everyone was informed on the case, warning them not to get into any trucks with strangers and to carry something to defend themselves with. What the public did not know yet was that this killer's actions were escalating. Only a day after Claudine Luera's murder, a young woman named Erica Peña was picked up from San Bernardo by one of her usual clients. She knew this client very well. They had been seeing each other for months at this point, and he had always acted like a gentleman towards her. 
Erica described him to her friends as happy and talkative, and expressed that not only was he a client, but she actually liked him as a person. He even took her to his home when his wife and children weren't there, something he didn't do with any of the other sex workers he frequented. This client's requests weren't like those Erica got with other clients. He never wanted to have sex beyond receiving oral, and often didn't even want to have sex, instead choosing to go for a drive or hang out with her. He would happily hand her cash, seemingly genuine in his want to help her better her life. And Erica wasn't the only woman whose services this man frequented, but they all had nothing but positive experiences with him. He was, by and large, the most pleasant client the sex workers of Laredo ever had to deal with. Which was why, when Erica climbed into his white Dodge Ram that night, she immediately knew something was wrong. Instead of the usual casual companionship she experienced, the drive to his home was fraught with an unpleasant tension that was all but radiating from him. And it didn't improve when they got to his home, either made worse by him assessing her with a look and asking, Are you scared of me? Something clicked with her at that moment, and maybe Erica had suspected him all along. Because she spoke the name of Melissa Ramirez, he didn't respond verbally, but his expression went blank and his head lulled, in Erica's words, like something out of The Exorcist. She was so overwhelmed with fear that she fled the house and vomited in his front yard. Erica managed to make excuses for her behavior, claiming she was sick and needed cigarettes and something to eat. It wasn't clear whether he actually believed her, but after hosing down the yard, he agreed to take her to a nearby gas station. Erica tried to keep calm, making casual conversation during the drive. But when Melissa's name came up again, the man drew a gun and pressed it against her chest. She always knew he carried the gun, as he needed it for his job, but she never thought he would turn it on her. A struggle ensued, Erica trying to reach for the horn to alert anyone nearby. Thankfully, they had already pulled up at the gas station by this point. During a moment of hesitation on the man's part, Erica managed to twist out of his grip and escape the truck. He had grabbed onto her shirt, and she needed to wiggle out of it, but then she was free and running for help. By some divine luck, a state trooper was refueling his patrol car at the very same gas station, and Erica ran to him, crying out, He's trying to kill me! The officer ushered the half-dressed woman into the safety of his back seat, but by the time he turned to assess the situation, the killer had fled in his truck. It didn't take long for the police to connect Erica's experience with the murders of Melissa and Claudine, and she was interviewed with urgency. If this was the same guy, he had taken two women with intent of murdering them barely 24 hours apart. Time was a luxury they couldn't afford. Thankfully, Erica had all the information they needed because the culprit had spent months visiting her. She knew his first name, she knew where he lived, and she even knew where he worked. To the investigator's horror, the murderer was a Border Patrol agent. Hey there, fellow true crime listeners. Are you like me trying to navigate the whole new year, healthy eating, new me mantra without sacrificing flavor or your favorite snacks? I get it. Saying no to snacking just feels wrong, especially when it's something as delicious as those raspberry and fig bites I can't seem to resist. But fear not, I found a game changer, Daily Harvest. Daily Harvest takes the hassle out of healthy eating, delivering my favorite veggie and fruit packed meals straight to my doorstep. No more endless meal prep or cleanup, just convenient, nutritious goodness waiting for me. And let me tell you, their options are anything but boring. From dragon fruit and lime smoothies to butternut squash and rosemary soup, oh, that's my favorite on a cold day, Daily Harvest has something for every craving and every time of the day. Plus, they're committed to sustainability, using recyclable or compostable packaging whenever possible. So not only are you nourishing your body, but you're also helping take care of the planet. Ready to say yes to healthy habits without the hassle? 
Head to dailyharvest.com slash TCFC for up to 65% off your first box plus free shipping for a limited time only. That's dailyharvest.com slash TCFC. Trust me, your taste buds and your body will thank you. Hey, fellow armchair detectives. Now, before we delve into the rest of the episode, let's talk about a mystery that hits a little closer to home, your tired, neglected feet. But fear not, because our podcast is proudly sponsored by Babyfoot, the unrivaled number one foot peel in America. Forget about crime scenes. It's time to investigate the rough patches on your feet. Babyfoot's original foot peel is the ultimate solution for uncovering smoother, softer soles. Imagine a product so professional grade, it's like having your very own forensic team for your feet. Say goodbye to calluses and hello to feet softer than a confession under interrogation lights. Just like solving a case, Babyfoot's formula is clean and devoid of harmful chemicals. No shady characters here, just pure foot pampering goodness. Your feet will feel as refreshed as a detective after cracking a tough case. This isn't just any foot peel, it's the original, a true crime story of foot transformation. And guess what? Babyfoot isn't just a bestseller. It's the number one selling foot peel in America, making it the top suspect for your smooth soul needs. Ready to uncover the softness hidden beneath the surface? Visit babyfoot.com and use code TCFC24 for 20% off at babyfoot.com. Juan David Ortiz was born in Brownsville, Texas on May 22, 1983. He was the eldest of four siblings, all raised by a single mother, and seemed to have a perfectly normal childhood. He participated in activities with his church, the Pentecostal Christian movement called the Assembly of God, and was part of their youth group. Ortiz was also athletic and competed on his high school swim team, as well as running cross-country as a teenager. However, all this would change when he was 18 years old. Barely a month after he celebrated that milestone birthday, Ortiz enlisted in the U.S. Navy to become an emergency medical technician. Then, only two months after he enlisted, the U.S. armed forces were plunged into chaos when the world was rocked by the events at the World Trade Center on September 11th. Ortiz went through training in California, where the other men in his platoon quickly took to him and began to call him Doc, since, well, for all intents and purposes, he would be their doctor in the field, providing them with any emergency medical care they may have needed. It seems that Ortiz's Christian upbringing made him stand out from the other military personnel somewhat, as he didn't often swear or curse and he reportedly had no interest in pursuing romantic or sexual entanglements. One buddy who became close friends with Ortiz, Jerry Solis, described him as a good man and the kind of guy you could trust. By early 2003, Ortiz and his unit were in Baghdad after a brief stint in Kuwait. They were only stationed there until May of the same year, when President George W. Bush's Mission Accomplished speech brought Ortiz's unit home for leave. During those months abroad, Ortiz cared for the wounded and the dying, and though he luckily never received any injuries himself, the experience was one that would deeply traumatize him. On leave, Ortiz reconnected with a friend from high school named Daniela, and a year later they were married. Over the next few years, Ortiz busied himself with studies, attending the Navy Medicine Training Support Center in San Antonio, Texas, and on top of that, earning a bachelor's degree in criminal justice online with the American Military University. Ortiz left the Navy in May 2009 with a number of decorations and accolades, including the National Defense Service Medal and the Rifle Marksmanship Ribbon, and decided that the next career path he wanted to follow was with the Border Patrol. According to friend Eric Aguilar, the choice was an altruistic one. He said that Ortiz wanted to use his medical skills to help migrants who had been traveling for days in the desert just to get to the United States. However, according to a letter Ortiz himself wrote to the San Antonio Police Department, the motivation was more self-serving than he claimed to his friends. The SAPD had offered Ortiz a position on the police force, but he had declined the offer, as the position with the Border Patrol would see him starting at a higher rate of pay. The Border Patrol gig would also enable him to count his years in the military towards the minimum requirement for retiring with benefits and a lifetime pension. But sure, 
I guess he wanted to help people. Training for the role included drug screening, fitness exams, using the agency-issued 40 caliber pistol, and off-road driving. All of this took place during an intensive 58-day course at the Border Patrol Academy in New Mexico, and he also took classes in criminal and immigration law on the side. Ortiz hit the ground running in his new job. Literally, he had to chase down drug traffickers, undocumented immigrants, and coyotes, the men who smuggled immigrants across the border. He took even more classes, this time at San Antonio's St. Mary's University, and earned himself a master's degree in international relations. In 2010, Congress passed a law requiring a background check for Border Patrol agents to take place every five years to ensure nobody was abusing their power. And in 2014, Ortiz passed his review. He rose to the ranks of intelligence supervisor in 2017, which placed him in charge of locating drug stashes and targeting the leaders of drug trafficking and smuggling rings. The only on-the-job complaint Ortiz ever received was an allegation that he had stolen a cigarette from a detained immigrant. By 2018, it truly seemed like Ortiz had made it. He and his wife Daniela had two children and moved into a brand new house in North Laredo. The family attended the First Assembly of God on Sundays, and Ortiz spent almost all of his time with his family. Sometimes he would meet up with a Marine buddy, Jerry Solis, who had been Ortiz's best man at his wedding, and they would go hunting or fishing. But two of his closest friends saw something change in Ortiz. Eric Aguilar, the same friend who explained that Ortiz wanted to use his medical skills to help immigrants, often texted back and forth with a man he still referred to as Doc. He was concerned about Ortiz, who would send him photos of skeletal human remains he found in the desert, and even told him he felt like he was back in Iraq due to the intensely stressful and dangerous positions he often found himself in. Aguilar felt that Ortiz had PTSD, and he broached the issue and gently suggested Ortiz might need to leave Border Patrol for his own health. Ortiz brushed off his friend's concerns, adamant that he needed to be where he was, caring for people who needed his help. Jerry Solis was the other friend who witnessed the change in Ortiz. He said that in 2018, Ortiz began to rely heavily on alcohol and a prescribed antipsychotic medication. Solis tried to warn Ortiz not to mix the two, but again, Ortiz waved away the issue. Worryingly, telling Solis that, quote, I have no stress, no worries. I feel untouchable. And maybe he truly believed he was untouchable, because he began to openly tell Solis about the woman he had met at the gym and was cheating on his wife with. He even showed Solis a photo of his girlfriend, and Solis was shocked. Ortiz had completely flipped from his previous devout, loving, devoted nature. He could not believe that it was the same man bragging about his new girlfriend. When Melissa Ramirez's body was discovered on September 3rd that same year, Solis desperately tried to shake the feeling that she looked exactly like the girlfriend Ortiz had shown him. He had no reason to suspect Ortiz frequented sex workers, and no reason to believe he had been the one to murder Melissa Ramirez and Claudine Luera. Yes, Juan David Ortiz had been the man cruising San Bernardo Avenue in his white pickup trucks for months, picking up sex workers and taking Erica Pena home with him. Juan David Ortiz had also been the Border Patrol agent in charge of running license plate checks and assisting with the police investigations following Melissa's murder. When Erica escaped Ortiz's clutches on September 15, 2018, he knew the gig was up. He knew that Erica could identify him, and it was only a matter of time before the police showed up at his door. So Ortiz wasted no time. He drove straight home from the gas station, loaded up on ammunition for his firearm, and headed back out to San Bernardo. By the time a bolo was put out for Ortiz and police entered his home, Ortiz was already long gone. But what they found was alarming. No less than 12 firearms were collected from the scene including rifles, pistols, and a shotgun. It seemed like Ortiz had considered taking all of them with him before discarding them. Only one weapon was missing from the vast collection, Ortiz's government-issued service weapon, 
a 40 caliber pistol, the same gun he had used to murder Melissa and Claudine. And tragically, it was going to be used twice more that very same night. 35-year-old Griselda Alicia Hernandez lived a life frequently haunted by tragedy. Her mother was killed when she was only two years old, and her older brother Joey was four. Giselda and Joey went to live with their grandmother, and even though Joey was the older of the two siblings, he said that she was always the one standing up for him. When he would wake up in the middle of the night, aged eight, too scared to go to the bathroom in his grandmother's unfamiliar home, the cries would wake Giselda. She would get out of bed, comfort her brother, and walk him to the restroom and back so he wouldn't be afraid. Apparently, Giselda got into a lot of fights at school, some of which were to protect Joey, but she was a good person through and through. Joey described himself as timid, while Giselda was loving, quick to get mad, spoiled, and even though she could be really mean, she was also empathetic, compassionate, and loyal. As she got older, Joey recalled that his sister loved cheerleading and dancing, especially to electronic and Tejano music. But sadly, he wouldn't be there to see her grow up. When Giselda was 13, 15 year old Joey was imprisoned for a stint that would last more than 20 years. Giselda had four children while he was gone, who were adopted by an aunt before finally being removed from the family by CPS. Giselda kept in touch with her brother through FaceTime and by exchanging letters whenever Giselda found herself in jail. Giselda was vague about her life as she got older, and Joey believed that was because she felt ashamed of what she had to do to survive. She had turned to sex work out of necessity and was a drug user of some kind, telling her brother she couldn't stop. It was unclear whether she had a place to live or was unhoused, but people often saw her rearranging her belongings in a satchel she carried everywhere with her. Joey was released from prison in June of 2018, and the siblings were eager to meet up in person again. But they never got around to having their reunion. Juan David Ortiz picked up Giselda Hernandez from San Bernardo only hours after Erica fled from his truck on September 15th. He then proceeded to drive her 20 miles out of the city, force her out of the truck at an overpass, and shot her twice, both shots striking her in the neck. Ortiz then bludgeoned her over the head with an unknown object to ensure she was no longer alive. He then got back into his vehicle, turned around, and returned to San Bernardo to pick up another woman. Janelle Ortiz, though they shared a surname, had no relation to her killer. She was the second of five siblings and closest with her younger sister Rose, who was nine years younger than her. After years of being bullied because of the way she dressed and acted, when Janelle was around 17, she came out as transgender. Her close family were supportive of her, Rose excitedly accepting the big sister she had always wanted. Janelle's father, Armando, was scared for her. He understood how dangerous life was for women, a danger that only intensified for transgender women. It's entirely understandable that the family would fear for Janelle, as they had already been rocked by tragedy after tragedy over the years. Janelle's grandfather had been murdered, a great-uncle had taken his life by walking into the Rio Grande, and one of Janelle's long-term partners was in prison for murder. Despite, or perhaps because of, the hardships she experienced, Janelle was endlessly kind and caring. When her family members offered her a place to stay with them, she would bring a friend with her so they could have a place of safety for a time. Her aunt Patricia noted that Janelle always made sure to look out for members of the LGBTQ plus community, bringing trans and gay friends to her family's homes because she knew they would be accepted there. Janelle turned to sex work to survive, as do many other transgender people who often face discrimination from workplaces, homeless shelters, and food banks. She lived as many of the other sex workers did, moving between family homes, motels, and often finding herself unhoused. Janelle's family also believed she was using drugs and constantly feared for her safety when she wasn't home with them. Devastatingly, they were right to fear for Janelle. Research by the Trans Murder Monitoring Project reported that between 2008 and 2017, 2,609 trans women were murdered worldwide, and 62% of these women were sex workers. Janelle was especially at risk, 
as according to the National Transgender Discrimination Survey, Black and Latinx transgender women are significantly more likely to experience violence, poverty, and homelessness. On September 15th, Janelle Ortiz was the 21st transgender American to be murdered in 2018. Janelle was working with a friend on San Bernardo when a truck drove up to them. The friend Stephanie had a bad feeling about the driver, but when he asked if either woman would be his date for the evening, Janelle climbed into his vehicle. Juan David Ortiz drove her 15 miles out of the city, pulled over near a pile of gravel, and ordered her to walk behind it. Janelle, who had been friends with all three of his victims, confronted her killer, like Claudine and Erica before her. Her last words were, If you're going to do it, do it. Then, Ortiz shot her in the head, killing her almost instantly. Janelle's body was later identified by a tattoo on her shoulder. The piece of art portrayed Santa Muerte, the saint of death who is commonly prayed to by people in the queer, sex work, and criminal communities due to offering salvation without judgment. Janelle often prayed to Santa Muerte for protection, a glimmer of peace and hope in her tumultuous life. According to Rose, her sister Janelle also owned a Santa Muerte statue, but its head had broken off only days before her death. Janelle told her sister that this meant something bad would happen to her. Unfortunately, as we know, her premonition was correct. Less than an hour later, Juan David Ortiz was on his way back to San Bernardo yet again when he stopped to use the restroom at a Stripes convenience store. A Texas Highway Patrol officer identified the truck from the bolo that had been sent out, called for assistance, and attempted to apprehend Ortiz as he exited the building, while another officer arrived and attempted to tase him. Both attempts failed. Ortiz claimed the officers were freaking him out, and he made a break for it. Ortiz made his escape down San Bernardo and hastily hid in the parking garage of a hotel. Thankfully, he had left his gun in the truck before entering the store, so he was unarmed. As Ortiz hid in the bed of a truck that was parked in the garage, the scene was swarmed with police officers and SWAT agents. Citizen journalist Rio Real caught wind of the incident and sped to the scene. She live-streamed as, over the course of an hour, the SWAT team closed in on Ortiz's location and finally managed to apprehend him. Before his capture, Ortiz posted two messages to Facebook. To my wife and kids, I love you. And Doc Ortiz checks out. Farewell. Ortiz was interrogated for over eight hours. He confessed to murdering the four women and told investigators where they could find Giselda and Janelle, whose bodies had not yet been located. He claimed that he believed he was doing a service for the people of Laredo by removing the sex workers or, in his words, scum of the earth from the streets. Later, his defense attorney would report that Ortiz had been diagnosed with PTSD in February of that year, and that Ortiz claimed the drugs he had been prescribed had messed him up. A rumor went around that Ortiz had contracted HIV from a sex worker, and that was why he committed these killings, but it was unsubstantiated and proven false. As D.A. Isidro Alanis stated, Ortiz was perfectly healthy and sober at the time he committed his crimes. Criminologists were baffled by his apparent motive. He murdered two women he knew, and two women he didn't, while attempting to murder Erica, who he had reportedly been obsessed with. There was no sign that he had committed other crimes. His wife Daniela never saw any red flags to indicate he was capable of this level of harm, nor had any of his friends. In fact, Daniela had urged her husband to seek treatment for PTSD and was distraught at the notion that the medication used to treat him had, in some way, caused so much harm. Regardless of motive, Ortiz was held on $2.5 million bond and was charged with four counts of murder for the killings of Melissa Ramirez, Claudine Luera, Giselda Hernandez, and Janelle Ortiz, as well as one count of aggravated assault with a deadly weapon and unlawful restraint for Erica Peña. Three months later, in December 2018, he was indicted on one count of capital murder, aggravated assault with a deadly weapon, unlawful restraint, and evading arrest. Ortiz's arraignment took place on January 10, 2019. He pled not guilty to capital murder charges, reportedly smirking at the victim's families as he left the room. 
Melissa's mother shouted at him, Maldito asesino, or damn murderer, while the other families were too shocked to speak. Ortiz finally went to trial in late 2022, maintaining that he was innocent despite the taped, detailed confessions he had given investigators on the day he was arrested. During the trial, photos from the autopsies done on Ortiz's victims were so graphic that one of the male jurors fainted and had to be excused from jury duty and replaced with an alternate juror. Unsurprisingly, Juan David Ortiz was convicted of all charges and sentenced to life without parole on December 7, 2022. And honestly, good riddance to him. More importantly, what happened to the people whose lives and hearts Ortiz irrevocably tore to shreds? Well, the victims' families had specifically requested that the prosecution not seek the death penalty for Ortiz, as they believed that the death penalty would be letting him off easy. And I'm glad they were granted their wish, and hope that helped them feel justice was delivered in this case. In the days following Ortiz's arrest, Priscilla Villarreal organized a vigil for the community. She passed out white candles to the assorted crowd, and arranged for Christian music to be played and a local pastor to speak. The families of all four victims, Melissa, Claudine, Giselda, and Janelle, were in attendance, as were a crowd of more than 150 unrelated mourners. Many of the attendees wore t-shirts with the names and faces of the murdered women, and others sported signs demanding justice for all victims. Villarreal's Facebook page was also flooded with notes of remembrance and condolences for the victims. Claudine, Giselda, and Janelle had funeral services at Catholic churches following their deaths. A distant relative of Janelle's protested against her being buried in female clothing, but her sister and aunt would not be moved. Janelle had watched Aretha Franklin be buried in a red dress only weeks before her death and commented to her Aunt Patricia, That's how I want to go. They honored her request, tucking a red flower behind her ear for the viewing. You might remember that when Melissa's mother, Christina Benavides, was informed of her murder, she had sobbed about not being able to pay for a funeral. Her community showed up in support, and friends and neighbors donated enough money for Melissa to be cremated. Christina keeps her daughter's urn in the kitchen, where she can see it every day. Next to it is a Bible and a photo of Melissa with a rosary draped across it. Claudine's sister Angie spent months grief-stricken and unable to sleep or rest. It was only when she felt a comforting presence placing ethereal hands on her, urging her to sleep, that she was able to begin the healing process. She began doing charity work with unhoused people to bring purpose to her life, something that Claudine would have been immensely proud of. Joey Cantu, Giselda's brother, felt as though he had lost the last of his family. Both of their parents had passed away, as had the grandmother who had raised them. It does appear that he was in contact with Giselda's children, so hopefully he is able to find some comfort in that connection. When asked in an interview with the Laredo Morning Times what he would say to Giselda if she was with him now, Joey replied, You're my sister, and no matter what you've been doing, I always see that little girl who used to walk me to the restroom at night. Erica Pena was deeply traumatized by her experience with the murderer. According to her aunt, Marcela Rodriguez, Erica barely left the house, wasn't eating, and was constantly terrorized by nightmares of Ortiz escaping jail and coming for her. I really, truly hope that in the years that have since passed, Erica has managed to find some form of comfort and peace. Without her incredibly brave escape, who knows how many more deaths would have happened at the hands of Juan David Ortiz. I'll leave the story of the spree or serial killer of Laredo, Texas here. I think the best takeaway I can give you here is to hold your loved ones close and support them no matter what happens or what trials they're going through. I think one of Claudine's sister, Colette, put it best when she said, All of these women grew up in our community. We loved them and cared for them. We always felt hope that they would change. You might not understand this, but we never turn our backs on our loved ones just because they are going through hard times. So, let's make those words to live by. Credit again goes to Skip Hollinsworth of Texas Monthly, whose extensive coverage of this case made today's episode possible. Okay, listeners, 
Thank you for joining me in this episode as we file away another true crime case. If you like our podcast, please review us on Apple Podcast or your podcast player of choice. It's a really big help. Follow us on social media. We're active on Twitter for now at true crime underscore cases, Facebook at facebook.com slash true crime cases W Laney and Instagram at true crime cases with Laney. Our website is truecrimecasespodcast.com and you can follow me on Instagram at Laney Hobbs BO or on TikTok at Laney Hobbs. And we'd love to hear your episode suggestions. Send us an email, tcfcpod at gmail.com. This episode was researched, written, and edited by Jesse Hawk of the Inky Paw Print, with content editing by Lainey Hobbs. Audio engineering produced by the best in the business, Neeks, at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or at the InkyPawPrint.com. <laughs>